Hi, welcome to this section of my video. And here we're going to be looking at structuring courses into modules and units. In the last video, we look at how you structure the courses within the program. Now, after you have structured the courses, the next thing for you is to structure these courses, chunk it into modules and units for the purpose for which we want to use it for. And for me, I still remain your professor, Owajaje Juliet in the video that will be taking you through this section of the video. Now, let's look at it. We are moving from material design to learning experience design. Before now, we usually talk about material design, concentrating on course, course, course design, and leaving the learner out. You could have a material that is so attractive, but it's not communicating and it's not interactive. So when you're looking at the learning experience design, the focus is on the learner. The focus is how the learner can get the best out of that particular learning. So there are key things you look at when you're doing this. You look at the interactive content, look at the resources, look at assessment, and you think the think team approach because it is with the team approach you'll be able to work through. So let's take that one after the other. Let's look at the interactive content, analysis of student learning. For you to create an interactive content, you need first and foremost, look at the student learning analysis. And this takes us to the learner's context, the learner's environment. What is the environment where the learner wants to learn? Does he, this learner, is he going to have a conducive environment? Is this learner going to learn in an environment that is going to be blended? Is the learner going to learn in the virtual learning space? Now, if the learner is going to learn in the virtual learning space, does the learner have the right infrastructure that will enable this learner to learn? Now, what does the policy say that will guide the learning structure? So these are issues that you need to consider when going into designing interactive content. Now, the next one will be the characteristics of the learners. And in the characteristics of the learner, you're going to look at the personal characteristics or the demography. Right here, we look at the age, the gender, the marital status, special learning needs. Special learning needs may come up as an area whereby you have those with disabilities, maybe they lost their sight, they lost their hearing, uh, some of them may be an apathies and they need to move around or they may be apathies in their finger. If they are going to use the laptop, what method, what mode do you have for them? And even if they have to use the artificial fingers, are they going to be able to use it at the same level with others, especially during assessment? So these are issues that you need to consider while designing. They will have to look at the nationality and cultural values. Again, the way we think, the way we reason, our cultural value differ from one place to the other, from country to country. So if you are writing for learners that are coming from different cultural value, you have to ensure that you put that in place to cover each and every one of them. And the same thing goes with the gender, with the uh, age, marital status, and so on. Because working with different age gaps, you need to ensure that your content will be able to accommodate them and it will interact, they'll be able to interact with the content as well. Now we look at the expectation or reason for studying. What is their expectation? Some of them that want to apply for this program, what is the expectation that they are coming for the program they are applying for? Is it because <clears throat> they want to meet the job demand or they are coming for this program because they want to pursue higher degree of economic value or self-satisfaction and the like. Remember that the course is within a program. So again, there are times you allow students to select courses on their own, whereby you have elective courses. So if that is the instant, what is this course? What is the stand of this course within that program? What is it going to contribute to the program? Because that will determine what the learner will consider before choosing the course. Now we have to look at the prior knowledge, educational background, work experience that the learner have had. Then you have to look at the prior study skills. This person that is coming in, your learners, are they computer literate? What is their level of literacy in the computer usage? What is the level of literacy in their self-study skills? Are they self-motivated? 
Are they self-motivated learners? If not, you're going to create something for them along the way that you will not just first and foremost focus on the content of the learning, but you have to come up with a support system. Then the employment status, are they employed, self-employed, applicant, underemployed, or unemployed? All this has part where you are creating learning uh, content, you are creating a learning experience, and you need to find out what, how do they cope? How would they be able to cope? If the person is working at the type of job actually has to take a lot of hours, what will you do for this kind of student that will be able to cope? So there are some in this area, you describe, you will, in your class, you will surely have people that fall within these categories. It will be a mist. So what is telling us is that where you are producing your content, you are designing your content, designing the learning experience, you must take care of every one of them. And in this regard also, even to citing examples, you must take care that, oh, we have some that some people that are already working in an office and what the course they have come to read in the school is what they are working with. So for such persons, citing example with a, it's a practical thing would not be a problem, but there are some they've never had that practical experience. So if you keep citing example with something you know that, oh, all of them will not be able to catch up. What are you saying? You are encouraging attrition. Then also you have to look at the learners um, financial status. Because if it's going to be online, remember they are going to spend some money. They are going to spend some money to purchase data, get themselves running. So are you going to provide support system for them, for their data? What financial standing are your students having? That will determine how much you are going to provide support and what is required for them and the amount of things you're going to put. Because if you have to put in a lot of materials that will be heavy using data and these people don't have what it takes, they don't have enough money, definitely they would not be able to get the knowledge you want them to get. Their student learning needs, what are their learning needs? What are the social status they have? So all this will come in when you want to design a, a learning that is interactive because you must design the learning that work around them. You must be able to cite an example that has to do with what they do on a daily basis. Now, right here again, we have students learning techniques. What are their learning techniques? Where there will have a debate to say, oh, we don't have learning styles. But for me, I differ. Yes, there are different learning styles. The only thing is that all these learning styles complement one another. And for an individual, you cannot stand, you say, oh, I'm a auditory learner or a kinetic learner. No, but you discover that you will be learning more using a particular learning method over the others. But however, you still need other ones to complement. So when you are designing, definitely you need all the learning techniques. And you need to know that there are some, they are better off when they read more and they understand better. And there are other when they listen to video. That doesn't mean they will not complement by reading, but they will understand more by video. So when you are working on this, you have to incorporate all in. Then accessibility. Are they accessible to internet? Are they accessible to the infrastructure they're going to use? Are they accessible to their learning devices they're going to have? Are they accessible to their mobile phone? Maybe that is what you want to use, computer and the rest of them. So you have to consider the accessibility that they have that can enable them get in touch with the resources required. Now, again, the time and the length are part of learning to guide chunking. Because when you want to start chunking, you want to start breaking the bigger content into pieces. Remember, we have started with getting to know the program objective. And having known the program objective, we have been able to come up with the courses within the program. Now, we are now working on the courses. We're still going to chunk it further so that you do not come in a bit the information will not be in bit for easy understanding. So you need to look at the chalking through the learning outcome. That is the best way to chalk. Look at the learning outcome, and from the learning outcome, you'll be able to guide the chalking. Then determine the timing on task. Let the content reflect the learner's characteristics and learning needs. Let the content meet the learning outcome. The course material is driven by learning outcome, instruction, and assessment. So with this, you see that it is the learner that is at the center point of it. Because at the time you are considering the learning outcome is a learner, the instruction is the learner, the assessment is the learner, 
which are part of the learning devices that will help the learner to learn. Then branching, when they are learning, it gets to a point that you discover that everybody will move at the same level because the learners that you have in your class, you are preparing this material for, there is no way all of them will learn at the same level. Some will learn at a very high level, some at the middle level, some at the low level. So are you going to have a tool that will help you create branching for them? So that for those that are not catching up at a point, they can still branch off to give them materials, to give them uh, things to work on, resources to work on, for them to catch up with what they need to do before they can continue. This helps a lot to encourage learners. And again, it makes learning individuals you have, have individual attention to learners even when you're working virtually. But you need an authority tool that will help you achieve this. Now, we come to interactivity content. Again, looking at the resources. You know, we mentioned three things. We have looked at analyzing the learning needs of the students. And here, we are now looking at the resources. What are the resources that are required when you are looking at interactive content? Available learning infrastructure is very important. Look at the learning infrastructures you have. Because the type of infrastructure you have will determine how you'll be able to create a more powerful interactive content. Like we just talked about branching. If you do not have the right tool to create that branching, to help the learner to learn at the individual level, definitely you won't achieve it. And with that, you will not be able to get what exactly. So you need software and hardware for creating interactive content, you need collaborative tools, and you need creative tools. Then available learning content to make it easy for learners to successfully proceed to the next level or the next lesson, use adaptive uh, release, because this will help them to quickly proceed to the next lesson in their course. So when you use the adaptive release, what that simply means is that you may now have to give rules that will guide some levels of achievement. We will say, well, you need to do this. And if it is not done and achieved, you cannot proceed to the next level. And when this is done, what is it going to bring? It will help to keep the student focused. It will help the student to achieve what is intended to be achieved. And again, it will help to keep important content intact because you are focused. It will make the student to be focused in it. And the student must master it before it can continue. So it's a way. Then again, you can use the authentic content from reputable sources. Here you can use open educational resource. It's a very good one, OER. You can use link to useful resources and document. So it wouldn't be you doing all the writing, 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 writing. And again, you don't need to overbore the students with so many links because what you are linking them to, you must have to assess it and ensure that there will not be things that we weigh them down in terms of reading workload then you can get excerpts from tests. You can use third party videos, pictures, illustrations, practicals, or developed uh, ones. Again, you can have the self developed videos that you can use. Now, let's look at the level of interactivity against it, continue with the content. Use real life scenario because it will help to bring that interactivity that is required. When you are creating a scenario, use real life scenario for the test portion with appropriate links to other resources such as video. They accommodate diverse learning styles. You see, don't be so uh, groomed to one particular learning style. Even when it comes to structuring the activity, don't be so gloomed to it. For example, let's use the basic learning style, the pedagogy we talk about. Now, you may want to look at asynchronous, synchronous. Don't do everything synchronous. Don't do everything asynchronous. Then there are other things. You have to vary the styles you use. You have to vary the style if you have the live section, vary your styles. In the live session, let it not be all the time. It is you, the facilitator, that does the talking. No, there are times activities comes in. There are times also you have to bring somebody from the industry, a professional, to come and demonstrate to the learners using the concept that have been learned in the topic. Now, comment again, looking at the assessment and engagement. For your content to be very interactive, attention must be given to assessment and engagement. Create meaningful formative assessment. Formative assessment, again, could be classified as the learning devices. Because here, let that formative assessment be the learning outcome that have been set for each unit. So in every unit, you must have some learning 
uh, outcome and you must have formative assessment. And the formative assessment, let it be something that is problem solving activity that reflect current societal happenings. They would, things that students can relate to their environment. And the learners will be able to say, yes, this is actually useful to me as it is in the environment. They, this time around, you are not expecting them to score 100 over 100. No, it's a practice for them to get their mastery. Then check for understanding. You can use quiz, you can use self-assessment exercise, you can use assignment, you can use uh you can develop application then you can evaluate your question which could be multiple choice with feedback with comments because it's feedback that you give oh you scored this you didn't get the other one right that is not a good feedback when you are giving feedback give it back if you are using multiple choice questions give answers so that if the option you are giving is the right option you have to explain why that option is the right option. And if they click any of the other wrong option, explain why those options are wrong. Because from there, you see that the student will be learning. Sometimes you find that students sometimes get uh, a, take part in a quiz. And they say, oh, I got it right, but the system marked me wrong. Because that is the way they feel. But if there was an explanation, they would be able to come up and know why they didn't get it right as they taught. Now, again, you can use multiple choice, give feedback, create opportunity for learners to interact with the tutors for clarification on the assessment. Because, yes, I have done this. Remember, you are trying to monitor their progress. This is not final exam. You are monitoring their progress. So there must be opportunity for them to talk back to the uh, tutor, to talk to the tutor find that if they have challenge and the tutor will be able to provide them, provide knowledge-based feedback. Now, again, the last one we're going to look at is a team approach to learning. Here, when you are looking at designing learning experience design, first and foremost is to gather your team. And the team will incorporate the subject matter expert, instructional designer, learning technologies, language editor, copy editor, industrial or professionals, then the learner. They identify tasks and set timelines. You must identify the tasks that each of this person is coming to do. They assign roles and res responsibilities, set up monitoring and evaluation mechanism to monitor the project, define reporting mechanism. Now, chunking. We've gone to where you now need to chunk. All we have discussed so far is to help us gather the knowledge required for us to walk through. So right now you want to chunk. And in chunking, the first thing you need to do, there are six steps I've identified here, is identify the course. Pick the course you want to chunk. Secondly, define the course learning article. Define the course learning article. Then derive the major content from the course learning article, which stand as the module. Then you follow through state module learning outcome and turn the outcome into study units. Then state learning outcome for each unit. Then finally, develop the course table of specification. Then it is the table of specification that you will now use to do your writing. Because once you have your course table of specification, all writing becomes easy because you have already embedded everything you need to do. So it's like the skeleton of what you want to build. All you now need to do is to put the flesh on it. And once that is done, you are good to go. So let's see an example of table of specification. If you look through, we are having the columns and the rows. Under the rows, we have unit, course learning and compound knowledge, learning activities, subunit topic, learning resources, pedagogy, formative assessment, estimated study time, the person responsible for writing. You see, this is good for you as a mechanism for monitoring what you're doing. So right here, remember, we have already in the previous uh, chunking here, we have developed the content. We have chunked the content. We have set the courses starting from module. For example, we go back to use our first module, theories in learning. Other theories in learning, remember, we have been able to derive because we have to set object the learning outcome for this module. And from there, we have been able to derive this. We have learning theory of learning, theory for digital learning, theory for development, then uh, application of theories in digital education. 
These are the units. Now, the next thing is course unit learning outcome. So because of the space here, let's go to the next slide where we're going to pick just one of them, unit one, and see what we did with that. Now, here it is. If you look at this, you see here we have the theories of learning. And other theories say by the end of this unit, you will be able to explain at least three theories of learning with 70% accuracy. It means you'll be able to, you can ask state others if you have, but don't let your learning outcome to be too many. You have to reduce it. Don't let it to be too many, reduce it. Now, in this case, we have just one we want to work with as an example. Now, we look at the prior knowledge. In this case, there is a prior knowledge. It's not all the time you have prior knowledge. Sometimes there may be no prior knowledge. If there is no prior knowledge, leave it out. But in this case, we have a prior knowledge that it means this level of students that will be taking this course, they have already learned something about educational theories. And what were the educational theories they learned? They have about behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, connectivism, then transformative, social, and experiential. They have learned this. So which means the knowledge they are coming with is not totally blank. But they could be more confused if there is no clarification. Because if you are talking about educational theories, one could ask, what is the difference between educational theories and theories in learning? So, but right here, we have been able to come up with what they have learned, the proud knowledge they gain. Now, learning activities, we now have to look at our learning objective here. And from the learning objective, derive activities. So, on the activity, say, we want to explain at least three theories of learning. So, what will you do that will help you get this right? At least three theories of learning. So, I compare and contrast five literature to explain the major difference between this and that. Because that is, you look at this, this will feel it, oh, this is going to be a, um, a confusion for them. So, how will you not going to get this right? Because if you're going to explain, ability for you to explain means you have a full knowledge of what learning theory stands for and what educational theory stands for. So, right here, we are saying that one of the activities they're going to do is they are going to review five literature to explain the major difference between educational theories and learning theories. That will help bring the understanding for this. Then again, we come to the subunits. The subunit will be a sub of this unit because when you are dealing with unit one, you're going to have a subunit. So the one of the subunits here is the difference between educational theories and learning theories. Now here we have the importance of learning theories. It could still go on, but because of space, I just stopped there. Now we have learning resources. What are the resources? The resources are going to look out for five literature excerpts on educational and learning theories. So I'm going to look for it. Maybe I will now have to consider, okay, what is the length of what I'm looking for? Okay, maybe not more than 50 words, no more than 100 words each, five or so. I have to get it ready and I'm going to integrate it when I will start writing because I would have gotten them down. Then again, I'm saying I will need two minutes video demonstration, uh, demonstrating how learning theory has helped to improve learning. What is that bringing to us? Is bringing to us the important. So if I can get a video or simulation, because I can simulate something whereby you see the effect, how it is used, you are seeing it real. It will help the learner also to catch along. Then here, what is the pedagogy I want to use? I'm going to use AC Chronos. Here, there won't be any live class. I want to use asynchronous. And again, I want to make it transmissive. Again, I can come here and say, well, I want to make, apart from it being transmissive, I want it to be, to come for students to do after, before the live class. It is going to be live class because that is where it all matters. So you put it there. And that will give a guide of what they need to do before they come to class. Now, here, we now talk about the formative assessment type. And here I'm saying, one multiple choice question from a scenario to test students' knowledge on the importance of learning theories. So there is a guide. If I now come, I want to start setting my questions, developing the items, I have a guide here to guide me. 
And I'm saying all this, it will need 30 minutes to walk through. And who is responsible for writing? Dr. Abidoye Alani. So this is how we structure, chunk the units, chunk the courses, chunk the content that it will become easy for us to walk through. Having said so, now let's come to summarize all we'll be talking about. We have a move from the course material. Now we have a move from course material design to learning experience design. Criteria guiding the design of learning experience include interactive content, resources, assessment, and engagement. Then chunking of content, we have looked at it. What you need to do to chunk your content, considering the learning outcome. From the learning outcome, you now derive the topics that you want to work on. Then you organize the table of specification, whereby you have to bring in the resources, bring in the assessment type, you have to bring in the activities that are required. And again, it will now help you to have a full structure of what you're going to add flesh to when it comes to writing. So with this, thank you for listening.